I'm not a pessimist. I've always had a great deal of faith in people that we wouldn't succumb to frenzy or rage or greed. That we figure out a solution without destroying the things that we love. Seen ads on television hailing natural gas as the clean burning transition fuel. American shale basins contain an ocean of natural gas. What I want is to use our resources in America. It's cheaper and it's ours. It's ours. What would it mean if the United States and the rest of the world adopted natural gas as the fuel of the future? We've cracked the code for natural gas supply. And what I didn't know was that the 2005 energy bill pushed through Congress by Dick Cheney exempts the oil and natural gas industries from the Safe Drinking Water Act. They were also exempt from the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Superfund Law, and about a dozen other environmental and democratic regulations. And when the 2005 energy bill cleared away all the restrictions, companies like Encana, Williams, Cabot Oil and Gas, and Chesapeake began to use the new Halliburton technology, and they began the largest and most extensive domestic gas drilling campaign in history, now occupying 34 states. The method of gas drilling they use is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. It blasts a mix of water and chemicals 8,000 feet into the ground. The fracking itself is like a mini earthquake. The intense pressure breaks apart the rock and frees up the gas. In order to frack, you need some fracking fluid, a mix of over 596 chemicals, from the unpronounceable to the unknown to the too well known. The brew is full of corrosion inhibitors, gelants, drilling additives, biocides, shale control inhibitors, liquid breaker aids, viscosifiers, liquid gel concentrates. On the side of that frac fluid truck, it should say, just add water. Each time they drill a well, they need between one and seven million gallons of water. Each time they go back and frac an existing well, they need an additional one to seven million gallons of water. They can frack a well up to 18 times in its life. They started out west, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, Wyoming, Oklahoma, and in the south, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama. 450,000 wells times 18 times 1 to 7 million gallons is something like 40 trillion gallons of water, all of it infused with the 596 chemicals in the fracking fluid. The derrick tower that you see is the drill rig. The drill rig moves in for three to four weeks, drilling a hole that's anywhere between 11 and 8,000 feet down to the shale formation. Each well completion, that is, the initial drilling phase plus the first frack job, requires 1,150 truck trips. The breakdown goes like this. Drilling rig mobilization and drill pad and road construction, 10 to 45 truckloads. Drilling rig, 30 truckloads. Drilling fluid and materials, 25 to 50 truckloads. Drilling equipment, casing, drill pipe, etc., 25 to 50 truckloads. Completion rig, mobilization, and demobilization, about 15 truckloads. Completion fluid and materials, 10 to 20 truckloads. Completion equipment, 5 truckloads. Hydraulic fracture equipment, pump trucks, and tanks equals 150 to 200 truckloads. And here's the big one, hydraulic fracture water. For each well, 400 to 600 tanker trucks. 400 to 600 tanker trucks. Hydraulic fracture sand, 20 to 25 trucks. Flow back water removal, 200 to 300 truck loads. Which means that all the water that goes down, only about half of it comes back up. What you see here is the flow back pit, of what you call flow back water, frack water, or what the industry likes to call produced water. Before the water can be hauled away and disposed of somewhere, it has to be emptied into a pit. An earthen pit or a clay pit, sometimes a lined pit, but a pit where a lot of it can seep right back down into the ground. Colored flags. I have no idea what those are there for. Maybe it's the grand opening of a new pit. I mentioned the problem of water removal. Two to three hundred trucks per well. That's a lot of water to clean. To get around this problem, the industry employs evaporation sprayers in the flowback pits. The water is sprayed into the air in the sunlight so that it evaporates faster. Now, of course, 
You're probably saying to yourself, that's insane. That water contains all the fracking chemicals, which are toxic, and all the volatile organics, which are also toxic. They create ozone, hazardous air pollutants, and they fall down in the form of chemical or acid rain on the grasslands. Each well site is equipped with a mini refinery and storage unit. What you see here is what's called a separator. When the gas comes up out of the ground, it comes up wet. The separator heats it up to 212 and boils off the water. The BTEX chemicals, the volatile organics, benzene, toluene, xylene, and a host of others are all evaporated right there on the site. The gas is then pumped into a pipeline to go through further stages of refining. The big tanks you see next to all the gas wells are condensate tanks. The condensate is stored in the tank until the trucker can come and haul it off. The condensate can be anywhere from produced water, which is unusable, to a low-grade jet fuel. It's just sitting there, like a big explosive battery, steaming off volatile organics directly into the atmosphere 24 hours a day. Numerous air pollution advisories in Sublette County were posted by the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, stating that ozone in the air had reached unsafe levels. Ozone's good in the upper atmosphere. It keeps out the radiation of the sun. But down on the ground, it burns holes in your lungs. Sublet County, the size of Connecticut, 6,000 people, had air worse than Los Angeles on a typical day. The Texas Commission on Environmental Quality had no idea. The TCEQ had no idea how many gas wells were being put in and were in the ground around the city of Fort Worth. We were interested in kind of getting a handle on this. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what were really the emissions that were coming out from the oil and gas sector? And we didn't want to rely on the state's numbers. Uh, the state had just admitted publicly that, that they didn't know what the emissions were, that their numbers were grossly underestimated. So we did our own. We now know that emissions from this sector are greater than the accumulated emissions of all passenger vehicles, all the cars and trucks in Dallas and Fort Worth. So let me get this straight. You're saying that oil and gas development in the last how many years is greater than the, in, the total car emissions for the entire city? That's right. If you look at the latest inventories of what emissions are from passenger vehicles, like cars, trucks, vans, motorcycles, it turns out it's about 200 tons a day of emissions, the kinds of things that form ozone and fine particles. Now if you take a look at the latest emission inventory that I worked on with the Environmental Defense Fund from the oil and gas sector around the city of Fort Worth, it's about 200 tons a day. The rigs were burning diesel some of them 800 gallons a day. But that wasn't all. There was something coming off the condensate tanks. I'd seen these condensate tanks everywhere all across the United States, but I never got a chance to look at them through an infrared camera that picked up hydrocarbons. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh -huh. Tank, vents, school. All right. Condensate venting. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, you see that? This is just what's coming off the top. Yeah. And that's why you shouldn't walk up that ladder, <laughs> which I've done. Isn't that amazing? Whoops. Yeah. What is all that stuff? At most places where pipelines converge, there are compressor stations, huge turbine engines that compress the gas into the pipeline. Pipelines are designed to have this release where they're shooting natural gas into the air. Of course, they tell you that this all shoots up into the, goes straight to the moon and there's none of it lingering around. There's a cloud lingering over one of our subdivisions. When things like this happen, most of the people in the community uh, think that they've just taken their last breath. Calvin Tillman was so frustrated with the TCEQs in action that he commissioned his own air study. The results read sort of like the back of a pamphlet that you don't want to pick up at the American Cancer Society. The study found, and I quote, amazing and very high levels of known and suspected human carcinogens and neurotoxins. These chemicals include benzene, dimethyl disulfide, methyl ethyl disulfide, ethyl methyl ethyl disulfide, trimethyl benzene, diethyl benzene, methyl methyl ethyl benzene, tetra methyl benzene, naphthalene 1, 2, 4, trimethyl benzene, MNP xylenes, carbonyl sulfide, carbon disulfide, methyl pyridine, and diamethyl pyridine. Benzene in the air was at 55 times the public health standard. Carbon disulfide was at 107 times the health standard. The report states that acute impacts to health will occur with these concentrations of chemicals in the air. The cancer and neurotoxins will also have an impact over the long term. Mr. Hensley. Um, John, I just want to follow up on uh, some of the things that were just, just being talked about. And I know that uh, your company is engaged in a lot of hydraulic fracturing. What chemicals are used in the process? Um, 
if you would indulge me to pull it from the sheet and to be sure that I <laughs> read it correctly, I wouldn't want to offer something from memory that was, uh, that was incorrect. Please speak a little closer to that mic. We want everybody to hear you. Thank you, sir. We, uh, we've listed... Do you want me to go through all of them, sir? Uh, I'll start with uh, hydrochloric or muriatic acid as, as a chemical that would help dissolve some of the, the muds in the well bore. Uh, we would use an antibacterial agent such as glutaraldehyde. Uh, we would have uh, a need for a breaker that would take away some of the viscosity from our fluid that we, that we would use an ammonia for sulfate. Uh, we would need a corrosion inhibitor to, be, to allow the, uh, the, the casing strings and the pipes that we use to, to be preserved. That's the corrosion inhibitor? testing my site here, it's, it's uh, dimethyl formaldehyde. The uh, cross-linker that we would use would be a borate salt, then use also a friction reducer, the petroleum distillate, an iron control agent in some applications, a citric acid, potassium chloride, and we would also use an oxygen scavenger. I wanted to ask Mr. Appleton if you're aware of any of the independent empirical research that has been conducted that uh, in any way suggests that fracking does not pose a risk to water supply. Anytime you put chemicals like are used in fracking into the environment, it's a risk to water supply if they're not properly regulated. Let's clear this up. Um, I'm not here uh, under the authority of EPA speaking on behalf of views that agency represents. I will put Weston Wilson not speaking on behalf of the EPA, although he works for the EPA. In 2004, the EPA was investigating water contamination incidents due to hydraulic fracturing across the country. But a panel rejected the inquiry, stating that although hazardous materials were being injected underground, EPA did not need to investigate. Weston Wilson, a 20-year veteran of the EPA, wrote a letter to Congress objecting. He also noted that on the peer review panel that authored the report, five of seven members appeared to have conflicts of interest and would benefit from the EPA's decision not to conduct a further investigation. They came out with the patently uh, ridiculous conclusion. They had showed it was toxic and then said it wasn't a risk. It made no sense and only in an Orwellian world would you accept that. From 1995 until 2000 when he became vice president, Dick Cheney was the CEO of Halliburton. One of the first things he did when he became vice president was to form what was known as the Energy Task Force. They met up to 40 times with industry leaders. They only met once with members from environmental groups. The Energy Task Force and a hundred million dollar lobbying effort on behalf of the industry were significant in the passage of what's called the Halliburton Loophole to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which authorizes oil and gas drillers exclusively to inject known hazardous materials unchecked directly into or adjacent to underground drinking water supplies. It passed as a part of the Bush administration's Energy Policy Act of 2005. So all science at that point stopped? All science, all data, everything stopped. We were appalled about burying this kind of, maybe no pun intended, but <laughs> burying this, ki this secret uh, that it was known to be toxic. You know, uh, when, when the president says to its bureaucracy, uh, don't investigate, expedite things for industry. We do those jobs well, too. One could characterize this entire industry as having 100 years of history of purchasing those they contaminate. So they purchase the land and often with an agreement of secrecy of somebody that's alleging they've been contaminated by oil and gas production. So the industry itself has that type of practice. You're saying it's the Industry itself should be proving it and not the people This who are is America. We, we shouldn't be assuming that corporations can keep a secret, especially when they're practicing in our backyard. So the onus should be on the industry to prove to the government that their practice is benign and not that assumption. What you could be picking up from these citizens is what we should be investigating, but we're not. We're still asleep at the wheel. And don't assume since Obama got elected that uh, something's changed at the EPA yet in that regard. Even if they weren't true, they deserve an investigation. They're citizens of the United States. And they certainly don't deserve, deserve to be exposed to secret chemicals. It's not American. So I understand your question and your frustration and you're seeing how this 
may be a pattern repeating itself. But so far, we're not on duty. We're not present as a government agency to answer your legitimate questions. And we must be directed to.